Hello, and welcome to Campus Currents, where we help you navigate the tides of campus living. My name is Jenny Shira. And my name is Chloe Platt. Today, we're going to be wrapping up the quarter with the best spectator stories of May. With this being the last Campus Currents of the school year, let's look at the most recent events in a year-long push for Palestinian liberation by students. Seattle University has seen multiple demonstrations, teach-ins, debates, and announcements surrounding administration support for a ceasefire and expression of solidarity with Palestine. One of the main sources of student frustration with administrative response is the perceived neutrality of the university. This frustration is compounded by students' alleged difficulty navigating the policies within the Student Code of Conduct regarding demonstrations and concerns about certain speakers who have and haven't been allowed on campus. Most recently, a pro-Palestinian demonstration was held May 2nd at 12th Avenue Square Park. At the north entrance to campus, two Seattle U public safety officers watched the administration building. In the south, another stood on the sidewalk facing Cherry Street and the demonstration. All buildings were locked and only accessible by ID swipe, with President Peñal there later citing concerns at a town hall of the possibility of non-campus actors trying to access buildings. Many students expressed that the university's lockdown response sends a particular message to student activists, despite being an institution that instills social justice in the curriculum. A member from Seattle University's Students for Justice in Palestine, SUSJP, who requested to remain anonymous, shared that the prolonged process of registering their demonstration with the university barred them from advertising in a timely manner, adding to why the May 2nd rally was held adjacent to Seattle U's campus. Following the demonstration, the President's Town Hall took place May 7th. Nearly an hour into the Town Hall, a student asked about university demonstration policies and expressed a perception that the administration was opposing student protesters. The student and the President spoke over one another, and one staff member subsequently commented that they were concerned by the, quote, argumentative tone with which the President addressed students, end quote. President Peñalver thanked the staff member for the feedback but asserted that the administration has not criticized or vilified students. Following the town hall, SUSJP executives had a closed door meeting with President Peñalver. Shortly following, SUSJP uploaded a post to Instagram quoting the president as saying the phrase, quote, genocide is a contestable term, end quote, in reference to Palestine. Student reactions online were strongly negative. While the Seattle U community navigates free speech in a national context, campus policies and demonstrations, and relationships between students, faculty, and administration, conflict continues to rage in Gaza. Actions taken in the coming weeks, months, and years have the potential to alter not only university attitudes, but make chan tangible change. While student activists have felt unsupported by the university administration in their protesting efforts, the Black Student Union has also faced challenges in receiving university support. Let's learn about the state of the Black Student Union today. Born out of the need for community and the urgency to foster a safe space where one can voice concerns, Seattle University's Black Student Union, or BSU, was founded in the late 1960s. Because the BSU has had difficulty with student attendance and has felt that they lack support from Seattle U, the club's endeavors have been inconsistent over the years. Increasing student attendance is a short-term goal that BSU officers have been tasked with. Despite intervals of inactivity, the club has seen more involvement this year, making it possible for them to hold their annual showcase winter quarter. The event promotes the talents, ideas, and projects of students of color. BSU hopes that one day in the future, the showcase event will achieve legacy status. Reflecting on BSU, Club officers stressed the importance of unity and community for Black students, while expressing excitement for the club's future growth. As the year wraps up for campus clubs, it's crazy to think that my time at The Spectator is coming to a close. Wait, what? You can't leave who's going to be in charge of The Spectator? Don't worry, I think it's someone you know quite well. Hello, my name is Chloe Platt, and I am the Editor-in-Chief for The Spectator for the upcoming academic year. I joined The Spectator because I've always been passionate about storytelling and about giving a voice to others, and I think The Spectator is 
a beautiful medium to meet people that you wouldn't have talked to otherwise and to learn about things that you don't really get in typical class curriculum or that you don't bump into in everyday life and being a part of a group of students who are passionate about telling stories, passionate about finding out about other people, about learning about the world and having an insatiable spirit for curiosity, I think is a really beautiful thing and something that I found to be very prevalent at The Spectator. I am really looking forward to being able to help people become the best designers, photographers, and reporters that they can be. And something that I've really loved about my experience with The Spectator is that while you get a lot of critical feedback on everything that you write, and sometimes you'll open a Google Docs and it's just like an entire row of like, oh, AP style mistake, AP style mistake, um, which is part of the nature of news editing. There are always moments where you can highlight that like this is incredibly well written or you're telling a story that matters and I want to encourage not only in writing but in our design, in our photography, in our broadcast to recognize the greatness in each other and recognize the beauty in each other and to help uplift one another and to becoming the type of leaders, the type of reporters and photographers and designers and broadcasters and people that we want to be. And I'm hoping that I can foster an environment in which everybody feels safe to make mistakes, to learn, to grow, to challenge themselves, to challenge others, and to grow into themselves in a way that they're proud of and that they can move forward in their life with a more rooted understanding of what it means to be a participant in the media and what it means to be a participant in life. I don't know about you, Chloe, but I for one think that Ms. Platt has what it takes to run The Spectator next year. Well, Jenny, I'm going to have to agree with you or else I might be out of a job. <laughs> Chloe... <laughs> You jest oh, too much. Jest indeed. And you know what rhymes with jest, Jenny? A vest. The best. A breast. Okay, Jenny, no one likes to show off. The word I'm referring to is fest. And KXSU, in partnership with Fashion Club, just held a wonderful radio fest. Well, let's hear about it. This is really cool, bringing the music to your campus. Thanks to Kate, who reached out to me to play. Appreciate you. Um, yeah, it's great. It's a beautiful day. Fun to just sit outside and play some music. Yeah. I'm here because I'm an officer of Fashion Club. I'm this past year I was the um, head of photography and now I'm the co-president. Um, and it's just a really awesome collaboration because I feel like music and fashion go really, really well together. And it's a really beautiful group of people, so it's been really fun. We hold more than we could say. So Fashion Club usually finds the vendors um, and they do sort of all the back planning. Um, and then we sort of just provide them with the space and the tables and things like that. We really like working with the fashion club. Like they, I think they add a different level of like sort of fun to our events, um, and it helps people sort of stick around. And like because there's other things to look at while the music is going on, we really love when they come and a lot of people come to our events. So it's a really nice partnership. Seattle University's 18th annual drag show, Slay O oh Goddess and Drag Me to Hades transformed the Campion Ballroom into a glittering showcase of resplendent queer expression. Between gowns dripping with jewels, thrilling dance routines, and delightfully varied lip sync performances, the night kept audience members at the edge of their seats. Seattle University's Fashion Club was also featured at the event, with two runways showcasing original clothing designs. Hypnotic music and flashing lights transported the audience to the whimsical Bugland, where green and purple patchwork Outstretched fabric wings and draping chainmail created glamorous interpretations of various bugs. 
The event was hosted by drag queen and Seattle U alumna Isabella L. Richards, who introduced each performer with both glowing praise and playfully catty remarks. The queens had a variety of styles that made use of the surrounded stage, perfect for gallivanting through the audience and interacting with enthusiastic viewers. Drag has always gone beyond entertainment and been a form of self-expression and resistance to oppression faced by the queer community. If you missed it this year, be sure to mark it on next year's calendar. So Jenny, do you have a favorite kind of pizza? Of course! I love a good slice of Hawaiian or meat lovers. Mm, okay. Well, do you have a favorite place to get pizza? Now that you mention it, I can't say that I do. Well, you are in luck, because we sent a reporter out to find the best place for a slice in Capitol Hill. Check it out. So, face off first bite, it is a pretty greasy pizza. I think that they could use a little bit more firmness, especially in their carriage. You see that right there, it's kind of falling apart in my hands. But it was a good cheese bowl. I respect that. So, not my favorite slice um, by any means, but also not bad by any stretch of the imagination. So just put it in the crust, and I actually have to say that I like it a decent bit more than Hot Mama's. It has more crunch, even though it looks a little whiter and lighter. Um, and as you might have heard, the pizza was scalding hot, but in one of those ways where you want your pizza to be really hot. So, and great cheese bowl, again. Uh, I'm really impressed. I think that despite the undercarriage being pretty floppy, the heat was there. Um, and the crust was there as well. Good cheese bowl, and as you can see, the plate's not nearly as greasy, except it's dripping grease right now. <laughs> but it is what it is. That's what you expect from a pepperoni pizza. Overall, the undercarriage was not very impressive today. My first bite had almost a little triangle pizza of its own because it fell over so much. And then the crust also, it's almost lighter than what Ian's was and it's not as crispy or as flavorful, I would say, as the crust and base of Ian's. Um, I do like that it doesn't have the cornmeal texture of Hot Mama's, but I would say that they're relatively on par with Hot Mama's and that Ian's took the day today. All right guys, so I'm sorry to say, but this is my last pizza review of the year and of my Seattle U Spectator career. Hopefully next year, someone will take the torch and carry it on. But as of now, Ian's is our final victor and the best by the slice pizza in Capitol Hill. Golly me, that has me hungry for some pizza. You know, Pizza always makes me think of that old song. Oh, me too! <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some pizza and more pizza. I don't care if I never get back. <laughs> oh, I love that old song, so... Okay, well, um, Jenny, the producers are signaling to me that those are not, in fact, the lyrics. Yikes. Well, to save ourselves from even more embarrassment, let's hear about one of America's favorite pastimes. Softball! Wait, which one is it? I don't, I don't know. I don't care anymore. Let's just get into sports. Seattle U Softball experienced a crushing quarterfinals knockout in this year's Western Athletic Conference Tournament, where the Grand Canyon Lopes took home the title. The tournament was hosted at Seattle U's Logan Field, May 8th through 11th, for the first time since 2021. All seemed to be going well for the fourth-seeded Red Hawks early on. In the first round, they rallied to defeat Southern Utah 4-3, and senior pitcher Stephanie Madrigal felt the team played with great energy. That momentum would be snuffed on May 9th when they lost to Grand Canyon and UT Arlington, ending their tournament in just a day. Despite finishing the year with a losing record, the Red Hawks boasted two all-WAC team selections and two all-WAC defensive team selections, respectively. With Madrigal and HITS leader Sidney Frankenberger graduating, Seattle U will have some roster holes to fill as they begin preparing for their last season in the WAC. Seattle U has decided to move on from the Western Athletic Conference following next season. 
They will be joining the West Coast Conference, or WCC, on July 1, 2025. The move, which was announced on May 10th, will mark the end of the school's 12-year run in the Western Athletic Conference. The WCC is best known for basketball powerhouses Gonzaga and St. Mary's, and is composed mostly of private Jesuit institutions similar to Seattle U. Every Division I sport at Seattle U will make the transition, except for track and field and swim. These sports are not sponsored by the WCC. Instead, the sports will need to find new competitive homes, meaning a return to the WAC is a possibility. Seattle U was part of the WCC from 1971 to 1980. President Pañalver expressed how returning to the conference has been the goal since Seattle U rejoined Division I athletics over 15 years ago. Considering the exposure the conference draws to its basketball prowess, the future is looking bright for the Red Hawks. The Seattle Storm are off to a rocky start this season as they sit at 3-3 three three early in the year. They tipped off their season on May 14th against the Minnesota Lynx and debuted a largely new roster, adding stars like Neka Agumake and Skylar Diggins-Smith in the offseason to pair with all-stars Jewel Lloyd and Eze Magvagor. Expectations have been high for the star-studded roster, and the Storm seem to be taking their time to gel as a unit. In the team's season opener against Minnesota, they managed just one three-pointer. They looked more dynamic in their first win against the Washington Mystics on May 19th. The team earned their second win against Caitlin Clark's Indiana Fever on May 22nd and were more cohesive that night. In the 85-83 win, Lloyd became the second player in franchise history to post 30 points. Agumake chipped in an efficient 22 points. The season is still young, and by all indications, the talented Storm will look a lot different come October. Well, Jenny, it sure has been one storm of a school year. That it has, Chloe. That it has. I'm glad to have braved the storm with you, Jenny. And with that, I open up the floor for you to say your final Campus Currents outro. Thank you, Chloe. And stay, stay current, current, Red Hawks! Hawks.